get that looked at. If it ain't broke, you can't fix it. Booyah! This is our course on, one, actually our final project from a course on environmental justice uh, at the College of Social Work, University of South Carolina. My name is Nick and I am joined today by Matt Benfield. Hey guys, how you doing? I'm Matt. Nice to, nice to be with you today, Nick. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you could be here. Today, this final part of our three-part project was just a main goal to raise awareness in the form of a podcast, really, and hopefully we could send this out to some community constituents who would be able to hopefully raise awareness on their own about it. And so our goal for today was to talk about our respective projects for our environmental justice course and then discuss some individual experiences with it. Um, I didn't know if, Matt, you wanted to go ahead and start. Oh, yeah, I could start. So, yeah, again, this is a three-part project. Um... For the first part, it was about selecting a topic and describing the impacts it has on a, on a population. So well, I, I looked at a very broad issue. So I did South Carolina water quality and how it's very contaminated with chemical substances and whatnot. And so for, to kind of hone in for part two, I looked at the Charleston Harbor, which it has an estimated seven tons of plastic in its water, which is insane. If Lower Richland County had seven tons of plastic in it, watershed there would be an absolute outrage as there should be uh, my project as i just mentioned it centers on lower richland county south carolina and so i focused on part one how climate change kind of led to an increase in storms but how acute and intense they are so how short and sharp pretty much and how that leads to a lot more rainfall and so specifically for Lower Richland County, because it is the lowest part of the county's watershed, that's where a lot of the runoff heads to. And so because of that, it then disproportionately leads to more flooding effects in that area, not only just because of the geography, but it also leads to disproportionate effects on the black community there. My part one discussed how there were several different scopes of that, a lot of historical inequities and inequalities and oppression over the course of pretty much the United States history that led to the black community being in such a area that is, I guess, not desired by many. And there aren't many white affluent people looking to live in that area. That kind of gave the scope of the issue and how it disproportionately affects that population. Now for my part two, I then went ahead and described how there are certain policies within Richland County as a whole where that surround kind of like liability insurance during flooding, how individuals are able to apply for more insurance if you live in a certain area that experiences more flooding. Now, the only stipulation with, with that is that I found an ordinance or it might've been a city code, I can't remember, that stated that if there is an individual within Richland County that experiences it, then Richland County is pretty much not liable for any of the flooding damages. Huh? Exactly. That's what? exactly what I said when I read that. So my recommendation was to pretty much not only get the community organized and build uh, resiliency through the community to empower them to challenge that policy. Further recommendation was to completely strip that policy and reframe mm -hmm. it. Because liability, a lot of the time, even though community residents and individuals are paying with taxes for certain projects, it needs to be on the county for executing those projects and making sure that they are viable and have longevity so that, you know, uh, for example, like in 2015, not saying that that was all the county's fault, but we could have been more prepared, I think, and better suiting the community's needs. No, yeah. What's the point in having insurance and liability if you can't even have access to it? I don't that doesn't know. doesn't make sense. I don't know. In my project, I recommended that there were a lot of other organizations, not only not in Richland County specifically, but throughout the nation. I think it was Iowa City, Iowa. There was a water treatment plant, and there was an EPA project that when it flooded one time, that they then moved the plant away from the river, which is great and would lead to less flooding and better infrastructure for the plant. And then it, in case it happens again, it pretty much would and it would be safe. And so they turned that space into a green space, which then hopefully promotes not as much flooding mm -hmm. for that area and not affecting the residents. But at the same time, there's a downside to moving that, uh, that business pretty much, even though it is from the government. And it loses jobs yeah. in the community. Yeah. 
And so similarly to that of Lower Richland County, if you do the same thing, then you're just going to be taking economic resources of that community elsewhere in the county. Yeah, driving it away. The only other recommendation I had was just adding more green space to rivers and more to infrastructure pretty much. Because especially in Lower Richland County, it is a low-lying area in the watershed. Infrastructure in itself is non-permeable, which means that water does not run through it. It doesn't get trapped in like the asphalt on our roads or the concrete of our buildings. And so that creates a really slick surface. What that creates is a fast moving water. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times our infrastructure cannot handle it, which is why we see those disproportionate effects in the water flooding that community. And I didn't know if you had anything to go off of that with water quality. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. In my first part, I found, you know, a lot of the stormwater runoff carries contaminants into into rivers, streams, lakes, the Charleston Harbor even. Um, so I think like ours are very interconnected kind of. But I saw in my part two, focusing on the harbor, that the plastic can cause these chemical contaminations. Like that means the fish are getting contaminated, the water itself is contaminated. People who eat contaminated fish have the capacity to get contaminated with these with these chemicals, the PFAs, the PFOs, and whatnot. One of the contributors to microplastics are wastewater treatment plants. In Charleston, there are three that filter into the harbor. There's one on Rifle Range Road, Center Street, and there's one in Plum Island. Plum Island serves like 180,000 people. Rifle Range and Center Street serve like 53 and 35,000 people, respectively. And so there was a group that tested samples of water going that flows in to the treatment plants and water that flows out. Water that flows in is influent, water that flows out is effluent for context. So what they found was that a lot of what's going into these plants and out of them are microfibers. Microfibers come from our clothes. A lot of our shirts, jackets, and whatnot are made of these synthetic fibers. And when you do laundry, it releases those fibers and they're going into the water system. So there was a study done, and this gets into my policy. A, there was a study done in a small town in Canada called Perry Sound in Ontario. It's done by Lisa Ertle and her team. They wanted to see if they could lower the rate of microfibers entering the environment. So it was done over a two year period. They selected, they wanted to get 100 homes, but they got 97. Still good, still good. The only requirements was that these homes had to, their water had to flow into the treatment plant for the local community and they had to have washing machines. So they got these microfiber filters, they're called Filtrol 160, and they installed it on these 97 homes. They tested the water flowing out of the treatment plants before and after installation. What they found was that these filters lowered the rate of microfibers in effluent by 41%, which is insane. That's almost half, Matt. Yeah, on 97 homes. That is an absolutely staggering statistic. I mean, I guess if you're trying to improve water quality for residents and the community as a whole, that would be a great place to start. No, yeah, like it drops the risk of, of this con chemical cont contamination. Like it doesn't end it by any means, but it minimizes the impact that it has, which I think as we're working on our projects, like that's what we're trying to do the most of is minimize the impacts. Even from a, an advocacy standpoint, you know, very macro scale, you know, a community organizer is able to empower communities to advocate for themselves and in relation to how the government creates these policies for, say, water quality, like in washing machines, then if we are able to add those filters, then that would be one way that we can improve our water quality overall. Specifically in relation to my project, you know, water quality is diminished by flooding because you have all the sediment, and that also would include the water particles that you were talking about, the PFAs and the PFOs. Now, I'm not sure if that would be, I'm sure there would be some form of that in Richland County, maybe something similar, but flooding causes all of that to go downstream. And where is that in Richland County? That's the lower part of it. Mm -hmm. And so then again, you're seeing another disproportionate effect on that community, getting the blunt end of the rest of the county's flooding. And now, for example, I, I reached out to several community members who are even in our cohort, and I won't put their names on here, but they I asked them if they wanted to share their experience about what it was like growing up in Lower Richland County and any experience they had with flooding. What I was able to find two individuals in our cohort, and I'll read you what they said. The 2015 October flood was an event in my life I'll never forget. I was a sophomore in high school when I witnessed a natural disaster with my own eyes. 
The flood impacted my home and neighborhood. The road to my home was completely flooded. No one could drive on it. A tree ended up falling on my home, ripping down the vinyl siding and causing a small leak where we were out of electricity for two days. It seemed as if the rain was never going to end. I can remember my mom stressing about how we were going to get groceries and figuring out what we're going to do with our freezer and refrigerated items. The storm was so traumatic. And here's another student. Man, when that flood in 2015 happened, I was scared. The road leading to my neighborhood had collapsed on both sides, causing no one to be able to get to us if needed, including first responders. I lived with my dad and two brothers. I can remember my dad wondering how we were going to get food because the food in our kitchen was getting low. It was tree debris everywhere in my neighbors and it was covering the road. I can just remember thinking, dang, when is this all going to end? Everybody was panicking and stressed. We were out of school for days. There was too much damage done. I can remember it took so long for them to completely finish rebuilding my entire road. The flood of 2015 was by far one of the scariest moments of my life. And our final student, Southeast Columbia has major areas that have been a representation of what society would consider within poverty lines of Columbia, South Carolina. Individuals in communities near Leesburg Road suffered from oppressive treatment from hierarchies in Richland County. While growing up, there were local businesses that were abandoned, road hazards issues prolonged to be fixed or an alternative solution other than the actual repair itself. Most of these issues that resonated in the communities were resulted with a bandage method. I can recall recently that I've seen damage and unresolved issues that have not been attended to. There are many concerns relative to the safety of individuals who reside in the nearby areas. For example, since the historical flood in 2015, the county has yet to secure proper supports for the southeast areas. The repairs and construction that have been fixed do not support the high precipitation of rain. In the results of this, there are many homes and families who suffer from damages to their home and hinders their daily functions and lives currently in 2023. Jeez. You can't help but think about the trauma that this community faces. Think about the infrastructure and how poor it is. And as the rain continues to happen and flooding continues to happen, also that water is just going to stand even longer, causing even more problems for that community's health. Exactly. And this can be such a heavy topic, and I kind of want to acknowledge that and sit in it for a moment, that these families and people are being adversely affected to this day. And that there is not a solution for it right now. It's going to go into a historical legacy. Yeah. And I know uh, several of the people who I were able to interview for this spoke about the 2015 flood. And that, I think, kind of brought my project into perspective for not only Lower Richland County, but the rest of the county. Because there was such a disproportionate effect, that's why I recommended the things that I did in part two, where if we add more green space near our infrastructure, roads, things that are important for the community to have and access further resources, those things are able to slow down water, reduce landslides where the land simply because it is oversaturated simply just washes away. And that's where we can protect our infrastructure too, and then furthermore protect our community and the residents in it. And so I thought that, you know, we've, we've gone through this course together um, and had some uh, experiential days out of class where we went and worked with the organization LAMSI, and we spoke with Omar and Inca, the director and an employee of them. And so I thought they do a lot of great community organizing and they uphold a lot of integrity for the community as well to empower them to make their own decisions and not be an organization that just comes in with a solution already in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're very collaborative. I agree. Work together with that community, which you don't see very often, I don't think. No, and and that too can be a, a downside for the community. If the community may not feel together enough or feel enough belonging, they may not have a a shared idea, a shared issue, and that could be a hindrance at some points. Now, if the community is not able to band together, then there would be a longevity issue. Mm -hmm. When will the issue be advocated for? When will the issue start being talked about? And I think that was the ultimate goal of this project here now with our podcast. Just to get that going. 
get yeah. those conversations happening. And get that out to hopefully community organizers. Oh. Hopefully we could send this out and get a, enough of an outreach that we'll be able to make some form of change. No, yeah. Yeah. I think looking back to these to these microfiber filters, the state of Oregon actually proposed a bill earlier this year. But their goal is to have by January first 2026 prohibit the sale of new clothes washers unless they're equipped with built-in or inline microfiber filters so oregon is taking the steps to try and diminish the issue i think every state actually (laughs) should take this step also because like if you look back at the study microfibers dropped by a rate of 41 percent and that's on 97 homes think about how much it would drop if it was in every single house in America. Yeah, if every home had that, yeah, the effect would be significant. Right, like every home, every laundromat. You even mentioned as far as like try air drying your clothes like on a clothesline, like our grandparents used to do. I think that would help also. I mean, I haven't done that in a, in a long time, but you know, I do it for certain clothes, and I think it wouldn't be that bad of an idea. You know, it would definitely save a lot of energy for my home. Think about the impact it could have. So much better for the environment. There's less less risk in the water. And I think if we are able to diminish that level of risk within our communities, then I think that would be a, a, a good first step in the direction towards helping these communities not face such outcomes. Mm-hmm. Because these communities already face historical discrimination because Lower Richland County is predominantly black. Mm-hmm. It is a black community, and because of that, these peoples were forced there because it is an undesirable location. Why would anyone want to purposefully go live in a place that floods consistently? Yeah. And so if we're able to, I think, provide agency for change and empowerment, then, you know, who's to say where that would go? I, you know, I can't say what the community would find important because we would need to ask them. Yeah. And it would be unethical for us to go into the community for this project and then just leave once we get the results that we wanted. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be having any integrity or ethical standard for ourselves as future social workers. Right. And there's no, it's like evidence-based practices aren't really incorporated into that either. Once, like, you gotta do the research, have those conversations, band together with this, with these communities, you have to do something can't just sit idly by or just say, hey, do this, and then leave. That's not how it works. And there are so many organizations that I think we could think of off the top of our head that do that, that come in with an idea of what they want to fix for a community, but not give the community's input, you know, and what they think is the real issue. And the real issue is these communities are seen as less desirable, poor, and not deserving of additional resources to fix their systemic issues. These communities intersect with things like food deserts, poor structure, infrastructure, and lack resources to fix those. And these communities don't have equity with other local communities surrounding like Lower Richland County and the Charleston Harbor area. Nick, I wanna ask you, how do we provide equity for, for these communities with flooding and microplastics? What do you think? Well, I mean, we have to dismantle the stigma around you know undesirable communities and the factors that lead to those dis- disproportionate effects of flooding and microplastics uh, in the water. You know, we need to start with like community organizing, uh, community-centered and focused and community-driven ideas because really the community is who has the answers, not everyone else coming in and telling them what needs to be fixed. You know, the community will be the ones that will be able to buy, uh, band together and really make their issues, really provide agency for the change of their mm-hmm. issues that they have. So how do we make that more desirable? I don't know. Uh, again, that's up to the community <laughs> because I think when we throw around the word desirable, you get the connotation of gentrification Mm -hmm. You know, as soon as we start making these communities desirable, then what happens to the original residents? You know, as gentrification is, it pushes out those original residents, increases Mm -hmm. the property values. You know, then those people can't afford to live in the place that they are currently living in because they're being pushed out. Pushed out to more undesirable locations. Exactly. Even further Mm -hmm. oppressed and marginalized in our community, which is why we need to involve communities like Lamsey 
with Omar and Inca to really help facilitate and provide agency for change in these communities and then get those policies changed. And so, well, I mean, maybe not policies, whatever the community feels they need to change. Yeah, whatever they, whatever they need. You know, that's, that's the point that we're trying to make throughout this podcast is that even though we're talking about these issues and saying that there is something wrong, we are not going to be the ones who are going to be able to push change. We might be able to facilitate something, mm-hmm. but the community will be the one who's driving it, be the driving force in changing or implementing or you know facilitating some kind of growth or some kind of issue that they want to press forward, something that they maybe want to change. Yeah, you really bring in culture. You keep the culture there, keep community development community cohesion group keep all those dynamics within the community you don't split it up you don't take people away you don't force people out and i think when we can implement more of more of this community building policies or whatever they need then we'll find our answer and we just wanted to thank all of our listeners today for coming in and hearing what we had to say Uh, We just wanted to say thank you for the support, and hopefully you'll tune in to next week, if there is a next week, um, since this is just a one-off series. Uh, But we just wanted to say thank you for listening, and keep your minds open about the issues, and hopefully we'll be able to reach out to some organizations to make some change happen. Go Go Gamecocks!